Uh, let me welcome everyone. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator. I'm your host, your chief cat herder, and your guide to the next hour of conversation. The Future Trends Forum is a conversation-based venue, and we are very, very fortunate to have a fantastic guest this week. We've been talking about pedagogy here in the forum for years. We've been talking about different ways of making learning more effective, more creative, and more inspirational, as well as just helping us learn better. And among other things, we've discussed active learning and how powerful that is as a pedagogy. Eric Mazur, who is a professor of physics and applied physics at Harvard University, is one of the world's leading experts and exponents of active learning. Since the 1990s, he's been researching, publishing, speaking about ways of transforming a passive classroom into an interactive learning space. His work has been inspiration to people literally around the world, and I'm absolutely, absolutely delighted and honored to have him here as a guest. So in order to talk about active learning, let me welcome Professor Eric Mazur. Greetings. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Great to be here. I'm well, honored. Well, I'm delighted to see you, I'm, and I'm, I'm grateful to uh, be able to host you. Where are you today? Where are you coming from? Lincoln, Massachusetts. I'm at home. Oh, good. And I hope it's not too hot and steamy. It's on the hot side, but I'm inside where it's relatively cool. Very smart. Very smart. Uh, there are all kinds of ways to introduce you, and I just did my level best to just give you a taste. But a way that we like to have people introduce themselves is to ask them what they're going to be working on for the next year. And what are the big projects, the big ideas that are going to be taking up most of your calendar and most of your thought? Well, <clears throat> maybe we should go rewind the time a little bit. Um, yeah. Of course, for a good part of my career, I've been working on, on finding ways to, to engaging learners in the classroom. And when the pandemic started to uh, explode on the, on the scene, my project was how can I take what I've done in the classroom, adapt it, transform it so that I make the, the online experience uh, as the best it can be for my students. And interestingly enough, I, I was able to obtain results. I think I did my best teaching ever last year online. I think that that's no exaggeration. Yeah. I doubled learning gains. I increased student self-efficacy. I increased student sense of support and, and community. <clears throat> I, I can, I can, I can send out a link to a little presentation about that if people are interested. Um, so when the administration announced last uh, May or June that uh, learning was going to be, or instruction was going to be in class, no exceptions this year, my, my heart uh, more or less skipped a beat because I was uh, thinking, you know, it's almost unethical. I mean, for me to do that, given that I can do can accomplish better teaching uh, the, the way I'd structured it last year. So my project for the next uh, months or so is to uh, find, you know, a happy sort of compromise between what I did last year and what I did before and maybe make learning work even better. That's a huge, that's a, well, first of all, that's a fantastic story to hear about how you did your best teaching of your career during the pandemic online, and how now, as we are kind of returning to in-person, depending on how things unfold over the next few weeks, you've got to figure out a way to bring that back in person. Uh, thank you, thank you. Friends, I have all kinds of questions for Eric Mazur. Um, I can speak to him for hours and hours, but the forum is your venue. The forum is for you to put forth your questions and comments. So any questions about active learning and how to do this correctly and well during the pandemic, please just either use the question mark button or the raised hand button. And before I can even finish saying that, we already have a few questions coming up. So here is one from our good friend, Steve Ehrman, uh, whose book I recommend incredibly strongly, by the way. And Steve asks, in peer instruction, has anyone discovered an easy way to pair students who responded differently to the question? I'm guessing that students who initially agree are less likely to learn from the discussion. Steve, that's a wonderful question. <clears throat> and I'm smiling here because um, I think back around 10 or 12 years ago, 
I was involved in the development of a platform called Learning Catalytics, which was later acquired by uh, Pearson, where we did exactly that. Right, I mean, if you have two students who agree with each other, they talk to each other, regardless of whether they have a right or a wrong answer, they're not very likely to, to change their mind. On the other hand, if you have two students who have different answers, they're more likely to, uh, to, you know, to have one of the two flip their answer, or maybe both. So um, we actually, I should have pulled up a slide. I have it here, Randy, even though I don't know if I can easily share something. But anyway, I can, I can explain it to you. So we, we tried out different pairing algorithms, and we found that we could hugely improve the efficacy of peer instruction by pairing two students who have different answers. Maybe I should stay, take a step back for a moment and because I, I'm not sure that everybody in the audience knows about peer instruction. Peer instruction essentially is, a, is an interactive engagement technique. Um, rather than focusing in the classroom on transferring information by lecturing, I move the information transfer phase out of the classroom by either having the students read a chapter out of a textbook or watch a video or whatever Let, let's let's put that aside for now and then in the time that i have with my students in the classroom i teach by questioning rather than by telling so i talk a few minutes i ask a question the students think i have them commit to an answer this could be with a clicker in fact, you know, shortly after I developed peer instruction, the clicker was developed to support yeah. that method of instruction, or it could be by writing the answer on a piece of paper. It doesn't really matter, but I want them to commit to an answer. Then I tell my students, find a person sitting near you, or if necessary, get up and walk around, who has a different answer, and try to convince that person that you're right and he or she is wrong. Complete chaos in the classroom. I typically teach large classes. Um, but the remarkable thing that happens is that students tend to move in the direction of the desired answer. I'm saying desired answer because not all of you may be teaching the sciences where there is a correct answer, right? So it might be, it might be not as black and white as it could be uh, in some um, some of the uh, more exact sciences. Um, why does the method work? Well, imagine you have two students sitting next to each other, John and Mary. Mary has the right answer because she understands it. John does not have the right answer and still has a problem with his understanding. On average, Mary is more likely to convince John than the other way around, simply by the force of logic reasoning. But, and here's the important point, Mary is more likely to convince John than Professor Mazur in front of the class. Why? Because she doesn't suffer from what Susan Ambrose in her book, uh, How Learning Works, calls the expert blind spot. Mm -hmm. She's only recently learned it, so she still knows what the difficulties are that a beginning learner has. Well, Professor Mazur learned it such a long time ago, he cannot even understand why somebody doesn't understand it. So using that approach, I found that, um, that I could, you know, increase the learning gains substantially. Now, as Steve asked, and thank you so much for asking that, students, you know, don't follow the instruction of find a person who has a different answer that well. <laughs> They're much more inclined to talk to the person next to them who is likely to be a friend and who is more likely probably than a random person to think like they do. So, so, so finding a way to pairing students um, so that they talk to somebody who's a different answer is, uh, is very beneficial. In learning catalytics, which now unfortunately has become a, uh, a Pearson exclusive uh, platform, you know, students would answer the question on their device, and then after they answered it, they would say, please talk to Brian um, Alexander to your right, even if I don't know Brian sitting, hey, you're on the left or on the right? I don't know. I can't figure out the, the, the <laughs> my left and right with the screen here, right? But even if I would not know Brian, it would say, talk to Brian. It would give his name, and on Brian's screen, I would say, talk to Eric Mazur on your, 
on the opposite side, <laughs> right? And and it's not just limited to right and left. It could be in front or diagonally in front or whatever. It, it actually pairs you that way. So yeah, I'm not aware of any other um, solutions like that. Uh, be great to uh, to uh, have yeah. something that is more publicly available. I agree, uh, Steve. Thank you for the question, um, and uh, Eric, thank you for the the detailed. Um, uh, answer. It must be bittersweet to have a successful platform purchased and then, you know, put behind a, a, a wall like that. Uh, friends, if you're new to the forum, this is how the uh, question um, box works. And I think nine of you have already clicked it. So apparently this works for you. Now let me introduce you to how the video question works. Let me bring up uh, Annie, I believe, and Fenzi. Uh, let's see. Hello, Anne. Hi, Dr. Mazur. I am a big Eric, fan of your please, work. Please call me Eric. Eric. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and I was so excited to hear you say that this was a great year for you in your teaching, that you learned so much and you became a better teacher because that's happened to me when I began teaching in distance education and in adult education too. Um, and I'm wondering for you, what is it that made distance education so much of a better teaching and learning experience. And what are you going to miss when you go back to the classroom? Thank you for that question. Something that has kept me awake over the summer. Um, so, you know, I think that when, when, when the pandemic hit and we were first online, I, I found that most of my colleagues were in the frame of mind where they were asking themselves, how can I do online what I do in the classroom? And I think if you think about it that way, it automatically becomes a challenge. Instead, I was thinking, are there things I can do online that I cannot do in the classroom? And, and one of the things I realized is that most of classroom instruction, by virtue of the physical classroom, tends to be synchronous, right? I mean, you all have to be at the same place in the same location. And even worse, it tends to be instructor-paced rather than student-paced. Cool. And I asked myself, how many things can I make asynchronous and how many things can I make um, uh, self-paced rather than instructor-paced? And so I, I made a list of all of the activities that I, I did in the class. And I asked myself, does this have to be synchronous? Of course, if you have a physical classroom, it has to be synchronous, but if you're on Zoom, you know, there are a lot of things that don't have to be synchronous. Yes, if if the instructor needs to be there at the same time as the students, then there is some synchronicity there, but it might not be necessary to have the whole class be there at the same time. So I, I discovered to my surprise that a lot of things that I've done synchronously could be done equally well asynchronously, including peer instruction. Mm. And, 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 so, so using that, I freed up a lot of my time because now I could allocate the time that I'd normally allocated to synchronous activities to interacting with students. So that personalized the, 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 uh, the, 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 the instruction enormously. The second thing is my initial, um, my initial, um, you know, um, the, the initial thing that I thought of was, let's have a Zoom classroom, just like we have a regular classroom. But I teach a team-based class where students meet in teams of four. So initially, I had a big Zoom room, and then I'd break out rooms for different teams. But then I thought, you know, what I should really do, rather than having the students come to my Zoom room and my classroom, each team should make its own Zoom room. And then when they meet one of us, they ask us to join their team room. So we, we actually use Slack to facilitate that, right? So when the team wanted us, they said, uh, they said, you know, can you join team five? And we'd click on a link and, and join that team. So all of that helped in making a class which tended to be large and impersonal, much more personal and intimate. For most students, it felt like a four student class. The third thing that I did, which I can easily bring back in person, is that I, change my approach to um, assessment dramatically. Uh, in particular, I adopted a 
approach to grading called specifications grading. If you if you Google, uh, 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 yes, Virginia, there's a better way of grading, you'll find an article in in um, inside higher ed that refers to it. Essentially, specifications grading does away with uh, partial credit. You either meet specifications or don't. If you don't meet specifications, you can try again. Uh, and I also broke down the course into something like 68 little micro units. It was almost like getting earning badges. And then at the end of the term, the number of badges determine uh, the letter grade. It was a complete game changer for me. First of all, it freed students of the stress of you know completely derailing their grade and maybe even their career by one failure. I mean, you could all you can always improve and redo. If you don't meet specifications, you can try again. Now, I've never seen students work as hard as I did last year, and I I attribute part of that. I have no evidence for that, but I attribute part of that to this approach to grading. So that that was essentially the the three main changes: make things more asynchronous and and self paced, uh, break down the class into little four person classes, and then the specifications grading. Great, thank you. That was great advice. That's a whole guide. And and what, what are you teaching? Um, I'm teaching computer applications and uh, instructional technology for teachers, pre-service teachers. Excellent, excellent. Thank you and good luck. Thanks. Well, friends, again, if you're new to the forum, that's an example of a video question. So if you'd like to join us on stage, you can tell that both I and Eric are very kind to you. Um, so just click the uh, raised hand button if you'd like to do that. And we have one more of those video questions, actually. This is from uh, Kelly Walsh, a previous guest. Let's bring him up on stage. And in fact, let me just do some dramatic arrangement on the screen. Check this out. Wow. Oh, there you go. Uh, hello, gentlemen. Can you hear me OK? Perfectly, Kelly. Good All to right, see great. you. Uh, Eric, it is just uh, a real pleasure to meet you. Um, I lost uh, audio. Uh-oh. Can you hear me, Eric? Yeah, now no, I can hear you. For some reason, I, I momentarily lost uh, audio. That's okay. okay. Can you hear me as well? Yep. Very right, good. Fantastic. Well, uh, it is a real pleasure to meet you, Eric. Um, I'm a member of the Flip Learning uh, Network Board and uh, started by uh, uh, John Bergen and Aaron Sams back in 2014, and I followed their work and your work for many years. And um, being a real uh, curious about education technology for uh, going on 13 years now since I got into education, the whole idea of blended and flipped and peer and these kinds of constructs have certainly been the most, uh, have had the greatest potential um, out of all this sea of ways to leverage technology to improve instruction. And uh, I love the way you explain these things so straightforwardly. Um, you know, so, so, and that, my first question was going to be exactly what, um, uh, I forget her name, but the, the woman just asked right there, and yeah. it was a great insight into that. Um, you know, looking forward, I'm curious, you know, the, the pandemic has been so interesting in the sense that, you know, f folks uh, like, you know, myself and yourself have been advocating at leveraging this technology to kind of flip the classroom and change the approach and, you know, put the content outside of the classroom for so many years. And it's it's grown slowly as a grassroots thing. But that was like, hey, you're kind of forced to really rethink it. And that was interesting. Now, the big question is what's going to happen as we slowly, hopefully return to a more, um, I don't want to say normal, right? What's normal anymore? But um, you know, as the opportunity comes to get back in the classroom the traditional way, is higher education going to embrace the possibilities better? And I'm just curious for what your and, and so far, based upon your introduction, it sounds like you're already frustrated with no, things are going to start going right back the way they were. But uh, any particular thoughts on on where we might go, the potential, the likelihood to to embrace what we've learned? <laughs> well. <clears throat> As you know, I've been involved in in uh, educational change for thirty years, and sometimes it feels like moving a mountain one stone at a time. Right? I mean, it's uh, absolutely it's not easy. Change is just hard. We're 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 creatures of habit. We like to to continue to do what we what we did, and on top of that, as educators, we're the product of the old approach to teaching, right? And therefore we sort of think it works for us, therefore mm -hmm. it should work for our students. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I think educational change is, is very, 
very slow and it's very, very difficult to change the approach to teaching. In fact, you know, I think the approach that is used in most educational setting, lecturing is one that dates back to the middle ages and, and, and over close to a thousand years since the university in Bologna was founded, uh, very, very little has happened. I think the, the pandemic has been a, a jolt to 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 the system and uh i am very curious to see how much will be left i'm afraid that you know we're going to revert back to 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 a large degree to what we did before uh, the pandemic now there are plenty of examples um of successful online learning i mean take for example um the Minerva University, as they since they just got their accreditation, they're not called no longer the Minerva Schools, but Minerva University. I mean, students live together on a campus. Their social life is together. They actually transfer from one city to another, from one semester to the other, to get a more global experience. From uh, I think San Francisco to London to uh, to a place in India and then Taiwan. Um, <clears throat> But the, the, the learning takes place online. And on the other end of the educational spectrum, there is, of course, the Western Governors University, which is one of the largest institutions, I think, in, in the US with 120,000 students. Um, but essentially, all of the instruction is online. And in this survey, which was done by um, the Gallup, uh, uh, they, they came out on top in terms of uh, future life satisfaction. Um, so, so I think I think there are, there's plenty of evidence that online learning can work. There, where it's really important, I think that we're together in person is for things like the performing arts, social activities, being together, having coffee together, having lunch together, sports, and so on. But I think uh, I think insisting that learning has to be in person is putting us, unfortunately, I think, on on the wrong track. Mm. I would like to see this hybrid of a, fo following, in a sense, the Minerva model, where, where students spend their social time together on campus, <clears throat> but the learning is online. It's much harder. You see, this is the other thing, and I should have said that in, in my response to the previous question. Right now, the three of us, and in fact, all of us are sitting on the front row. On Zoom, there is no row two, row three. There is no escape, right? I can't even, on Shindig, I can't even turn my video off. On Zoom, you can't take your, turn your video off. Although when you're with four people in the team, uh, in, in the team, together you know it's not it, it, it doesn't feel right to turn off your video whereas yeah. the three other people have the video on so so you're sort of sucked in in a way that you're not typically sucked in into a physical uh, learning space yeah well, great observation well, thank you kelly thank you for the great question and uh kelly was a great guest uh on the forum about a year and a half ago and uh, Eric, if you need me to turn off your video, just just let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll... No, 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 I don't want to. <laughs> I know. Uh, first, we, we have uh, we have more questions coming, and I want to make sure that everyone gets a chance to uh, to ask them. And here's one from uh, I believe Adria Updike. Let me bring her up on stage. Let's see. Hello, Adria. Is that Adria? Adria. 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 Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Eric, I've been a big fan of yours for a long time. You gave a talk down in my area. I'm blushing a, here. Two years ago. <laughs> I had flipped my classes a few years ago. I've been doing peer instruction for a long time. But when we when we went online after spring break last year, we really ran into a problem with a lot of this online instruction because I had my students working in small groups. But our university told us we couldn't, for reasons of equity, require that our students turn on their video, so none of them did. We couldn't require they have their microphone on. And when I put them in small groups to work on problems, they didn't talk to each other. They didn't turn their videos on. They just kind of sat there. Now, I'm changing. I'm also moving to standards-based grading this fall in all of my classes, and I'm hoping that might make a difference in terms of trying to move them along and get them motivated to actually work together and solve the problem rather than get stuck a minute in and just wait to see the solution. But do you, I don't know if it's just a matter of Harvard versus a small university. Do you have any suggestions for dealing with that? Did you run into that at all? Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, I've certainly noticed that when the video is off, people are not as engaged. I mean, it's like sitting in the in the back row in a, in a large lecture hall. Um, luckily, my institution said that we could ask our students to turn their video on, and um, not everybody was, but but to but to you know understand that under certain circumstances, students might have to to turn their, their video off. I mean, students who had poor Wi-Fi, poor connectivity or, 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 or whatever. Um, but I also pointed out to students that, you know, you're much more engaged and therefore learn more if you can interact both visually and, and through uh, audio with, with, with other people. Um, so I, I, I think that might be, a problem now in some geographical regions for, for equity reasons, as you say. Hopefully, that is a problem that uh, over time will, will, I mean, it's not that long ago that only a small fraction of the students had had devices, right? And now I think even, even in, 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 in the furthest corners of the world, people have internet connected devices. And I'm sure that 10 years from now, the situation will be much better. And that 20 years from now, we don't even think about that anymore. So hopefully this is just a temporary pain. I'm, I'm a little bit, um, yeah, I, 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 I can see your problem when the institution tells you that, that you can't ask your students to turn their video on. My institution had a slightly different approach. They said you can set the expectations, but you have to understand that not everybody might be able to comply. I do have one other quick question. When your Please. students were working in groups, what did you have them working on? I, I have a whole bunch of problems that I wrote that I have them working on, uh, but have you used simulations? Uh, is there anything that you found that gets them more engaged? Yes. So, so we had essentially three activities that we had them work on as a team beyond the project. The, the whole idea, maybe I should very briefly explain what the course is. You see, the course is a pri I used to give my students the textbook and say, here, learn this. It's good for you. And I happen to, since I'm a physicist, I happen to think that physics is a, is a good mental skill. But, you know, if you put yourself in, in the shoes of a, an engineering student or a pre-medical student who has to take physics because it's a requirement, uh, having your instructor tells you learn physics because it's good for you sounds a little bit like your mother telling you, you know, you got to eat spinach because it's good for you. I mean, you, you don't want to, to, you don't like spinach, but, but apparently it's good for you. So uh, I, I thought, you know, it's like a, sort of a hollow statement to say it's good for you to learn physics. So instead, what I do is I put the textbook aside and, and I tell my students, and I already did this before the pandemic, the pandemic actually elevated this, but I told my students, we're going to work on projects. And I try to add a component of empathy or social good to the project. And maybe that at first sight, the project doesn't have anything directly to do with physics, right? I mean, I, one of them deals with El Sistema in, in Venezuela, where, you know, where, 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 where students play classical music, where classical music is used to, 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 to uh, do social good. Anyway, so after the students are really excited by the project, I tell them, here, you may want to have a look at this book. It may help you with your, your project. So the content of the course, this is the basic method, message, the content of the course is no longer an end goal in its own right. It becomes a vehicle in, 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 the, in the minds of the students, it becomes a vehicle to accomplish a goal that is more meaningful to the students. Mm. Um, so so, so the, that is the overarching glue for the whole course. But then I had a number of activities. One was peer instruction, which I did completely asynchronously outside of class. We can talk about that later. And then we had two which were synchronous. One was a tutorial, which was actually inspired by, by for those of you who are, are, are teaching physics, which was inspired by uh, the work of Lillian McDermott at the University of Washington in Seattle. 
And essentially, we took these tutorials and put them on Desmos, which is a platform that um, is mostly used in case for 12 math education, but which works beautifully for any interactive work. So essentially, each student would fill out the, the Desmos form on their own before coming to section. And then in section, they would share, each student would share with the other students their work, and they would come to some agreement, which they went, then would have checked by the teaching team. And then, and then on um, the, the last activity was essentially using, uh, they would work on a problem set. So students would do the problem set individually, upload it to Gradescope. And then in section, synchronously, they would share their work and try to essentially evaluate their work based on the work from the other students. It, it was very much meant to improve their metacognitive abilities. So those those were the activities that I had them do online. Adrian, thank you for the great questions. Thank you. And uh, Eric, this is just fantastic. This is a seminar on, on how to do teaching well. This is terrific. Um, we have we have more questions that are coming in, and there's one uh, from a former student of mine, from Andrew. Let me just bring his comment up on stage here. How does peer instruction compare to team-based learning? That's more popular in med schools. That, that's very interesting. You know, um, Michael Sweet, who, who is one of the authors of the book on team-based learning, <clears throat> which is on my the table in my uh, office because uh, it's played such an important role in my own thinking about education. The two have a lot in common. And in fact, um, from, from what I've said so far in this session here, I've adopted team-based learning. In fact, I have merged the two, mm. uh, the, the, the two in a sense. So, so I think there are a lot of parallels between team-based learning and, uh, and peer instruction. Thank you. Great question, Andrew. That's typical. Uh, one of our students was just wonderful. Um, always good to hear from him. And we have another video question coming from uh, Lorena Barba. Uh, let me just bring her up on stage. Hello, Lorena. Hi, Brian. Thank you very much. And hey, hello, Eric. I uh, haven't seen you in a long, long time. I know. Good to see you. It's a great pleasure. And uh, I have, my question is actually, it, it's almost the same as Kelly's question a couple, uh, some minutes ago. And, uh, you know, when we met 10 years ago, we were talking about flipped learning, flipped classroom and peer instruction. And you've been doing this even more than that, more years than that. <laughs> But, um, you know, you complained a little bit that uh, in, in the beginning uh, that you fear that universities want everything to go back to normal, everything to go back to how it was in 2019. And so the question is, well, what's, how can, we, why is it so difficult to disseminate uh, new forms of instruction? Why, why is this, this, this gravity pull towards how things were that now, I fear is uh, going to be uh, like the opportunity of all that we learned in the past uh, year and a half is going to be thrown away because people just want to go back to 2019. And all of the capacity that was built in the faculty may not be taken advantage of because there's this resistance to change. Yeah, I think in part it is a very, very, very good question. <clears throat> and I think it's it's not just 2021 to 2019, but 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 any any educational events that's taken place since uh, 1060 or whenever it was that Bologna was found to uh, to 2019 as well. I think in part it is because of um, to some degree the lack of a good evaluation of education. I mean, how do we measure? good education, right? I mean, is it the student evaluation of courses? I, I think that student evaluation bears very little relationship to how much is actually learned. In fact, the only, the only way to really evaluate the quality of education would be to look at how successful our graduates are five years after graduating or 10 years after graduating or 15 years after graduating. And 
and and and it would be very difficult if not impossible to 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 really do that what's more many institutions like mine and I'm, i have no problem saying this in public uh filter on the input end mm. right i mean we make sure if, if you were to plot you know quality of understanding or whatever or skills or, or on the vertical scale and time on the other we make sure that uh, this is the beginning of the studies this is the end of the studies we make sure that the students at the beginning are as high as possible mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right so even if we lift them only a tiny little bit they'll come at quite high maybe that's some kind of community college which takes the students in here and lifts them up there where they still end end up below where Harvard students comes in, it's actually a much better institution than my own institution because the differential is so much bigger. Um, but unfortunately, we don't use that as a metric. No. So I, 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 I think that, that one problem is that, you know, we rely on, on, on metrics that for, for evaluating our, our success that are not really telling us what we need to know. But you experienced uh, some epiphany and, you, you know, when you tried uh, peer instruction tentatively for the first time and you said, well, this works and you wanted to continue investigating and you uh, made changes. I experienced things like that when I made changes in my teaching and I saw, you know, a, a clear, you can see immediately when th th that things are more effectively. Uh, so even without a formal and serious assessment of the learning that would kind of move the needle, uh, something is missing on a, uh, to motivate a change on a personal level among our colleagues. And I just would like to understand what it is. Well, I, in part also, it's, you know, I think the, 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 the reward system, right? I mean, there's, there's nothing that really, uh, I mean, in the private sector, these things would work very differently. For sure. Yeah. Uh, and, and and institutions, I mean, you you do a really good job teaching. What happens is you only get more teaching, <laughs> right? It's not that your 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 salary will get grows up or your status goes up. No, is 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 it's personal satisfaction, which I don't want to belittle, which is very important. You know, you, you do great work in research and, and, and you get grants and you get invited and you publish papers that get attention and so on. So I think the, the reward system is not there to move things in the right direction. And I think we have very little accountability um, th this is the other thing, the whole assessment, it's not just the assessment of teaching, it's also the assessment of learning. I mean, Different. you know, when I, when I, I, I have a talk that is called assessment, the silent killer of learning. Um, and when I, when I put the talk together, I suddenly realized something that had never really occurred to me. Mm -hmm. See, when I changed to this project based course, the nature of my course started changed completely right and and the first year that i did that i um like i'd always done i was the one evaluating the project of the students and during 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 a month i'd been coaching them for their project and now at the project fair all of a sudden i felt like i made this jekyll and high tr transition between yeah. good guy the coach yeah. and bad guy the judge so so in a sense with a lot of assessment in education, we have this coach-judge conflict. We are both the coach and the judge. This would not be permissible in any other human endeavor, right? Whether it's sports or, or, or evaluation of, of any other activity. There are other people who evaluate what you do. You don't evaluate yourself what you do. How do we get away with that in education, right? So I can always design whatever course I want and whatever assessment I want for the two to match each other. I should be evaluating your students. You should be evaluating my students. But that's not what we do in education. There's a, a, a longtime uh, friend of the uh, program, uh, Kiel Dumsch, who argues that we should be doing more of this, that we should be doing more of getting assessment away um, uh, out of the immediate class environment. 
Um, so I think that is one of the reasons it's hard to change. You know, I'm, I'm just going to assess yeah. the way the way that matches the way I teach, and and it's sort of a silent pact between the students and me, and 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 then why would I change? An assessment is often what professors hate the most. Right? Um, you know, grading too much. Um, Lorena, what a great question! You really just thank you so much for that. Thank you for having me. Great to see you again, Eric. Good to see you. Thank you for joining. Bye. We have um, uh, just a little over uh, 10 minutes left to go, uh, friends. So if you have your questions, if you have your comments, this is the time. And again, you can see if you click the raised hand button, you can join us on stage for a video question. And uh, if you'd like to type in your question, just uh, hit the uh, Q&A button and uh, up it comes. Uh, and we already have a, a bunch of questions, uh, some of which have already been answered. But I want to give us a chance to uh, hit a couple of these. This is a really important one from Brent Anders here. Uh, Brent asks, were you given free reign to conduct your class how you deemed fit? Did you have to get special approval for personally deciding what would be synchronous versus asynchronous? So um, I did not ask for permission. I don't think I, I, I don't think I am given free reign, but I'm just taking free reign. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, if you ask permission and somebody says no, then you can't really do it. If you do not ask permission and you just do it, that's my that's my philosophy. <laughs> so I, uh, I I I know I'm, I'm I or I hope I'm guided by by good principles and 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 I honestly want to be the best I can be for my students. I act in my students' interest, not in self-interest. And uh, I'm always, you know, curious as to how to improve the learning. So I thought, you know what, I'm not even going to ask I'm going to do what I'm doing. So for example, you know, this coming semester, the administration is insisting that all instruction is in the classroom. Right. I am not doing that. In fact, I am giving my students a choice. Hmm. They can, they can, so, so as they enroll, and this is happening right now as we speak, they're filling out a questionnaire where on a seven point Likert scale, they indicate whether they would prefer to meet in person or prefer to meet uh, online. I only want to meet in person. I strongly prefer meeting in person. I somewhat prefer to meet. I'm neutral. And then it goes the other way to, to online. I'm going to put students in teams of like-minded students. So I'm going to take those who strongly prefer to be in person and who only want to be in person in teams of you know students who select the same thing. And I'm going to have another group online and then i'm going to have another group who can go either way and then they can decide if they want to be online they go to the classroom they sit around the table they share the work they talk with they don't need cameras and microphones but they still share the work on zoom just like we do online and if they need me they reach out on slack and i'll walk up to the table i'll have to have a mask but you know that's okay i'll have the mask i went to an oral exam yesterday I had trouble yeah. understanding what I everybody what everybody was saying. But anyway, I'll be there sitting at the table with them and we'll go over the activity. If they're on Zoom, my office is conveniently right next to the classroom. Oh. So I only need to go, you know, one one uh well actually it's right underneath it, so I need to go this down the stairs. I'll be in my office and I'll join their team Zoom room. So so that gives them a lot of flexibility. I will encourage students to try both modalities so they can find out what works better mm -hmm. for them. And, um, you know, I think had I asked the administration, they would have said no. In fact, a colleague of mine asked at a town hall meeting earlier this, um, this week if they could do this, poll their students, and uh, the, the answer was a firm no. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. So that's asking permission would have not worked out for you in that case. I guess not. <laughs> we'll talk, we'll see if I'm still employed by the end of this. Yeah, semester. Well, let me know. <laughs> let's keep in touch. This is the Future Trends Forum. We give you dangerous advice for your career. <laughs> we, we have a, a, another question coming from um, uh, a, firm, a fellow with a wonderful first name. We have Brian Mulligan, and let's bring him up on stage. Um, hello, Brian. 
Hi, hi guys. Hi, Brian. Hi, Eric. Good to meet you. I'll um, save your blushes here and say I've been a moderate fan of yours for quite a <laughs> while. <Moderate. laughs> but then I discovered perusal, and now I'm in danger of turning into a big fan of yours. Yeah. Uh, I hope this question isn't unfair, but to some extent, uh, it is linked to perusal because I see this as a tool that will lower the cost of improving quality, improving interaction, and lower the cost of assessment. And uh, I just worry that we're constantly talking about increasing the quality of learning when a big challenge in the world is access and cost. The way I see it in higher education, access and cost are more important challenges than uh, improving quality. Mm. I see it like a, a Pareto rule type of thing that if we could achieve 80% of the quality of what we're doing now at 20% of the cost, that would be a far better uh, achievement than these incremental uh, improvements in quality that we're doing in higher education. So I've been coming and I've been in higher education for 37 years and I've come to the conclusion it's the wrong model for the future. Things like your perusal are pointing to the way things are going because we know now it's easy, to, it's cheap to deliver content. The problem is how can we uh, encourage engagement and uh, to some extent measure learning or assess people. We have to drive down the costs of those things and uh, perusal works towards that. But it does beg the question, are we pushing the wrong way in education? Are we constantly trying to justify the high fees, the high debt that either individuals in the US take on or the state is taking on in Europe because it's so heavily subsidized? Uh, are we justifying these high costs by trying to improve the quality when in actual fact, we should be trying to reduce the cost? And this is particularly important for the emerging world, for low-income countries. So maybe this isn't a fair question, but because... No, no, you, no. Yeah, I, I, I'd love to get your opinion on that. I, I think it's a very, very fair question. And I, I mentioned the Minerva School, University, mm -hmm. pardon me, they changed their, their name, and, um, and Western Governors, and both are example of, you know, substantially lowering cost and delivering high quality education. And, and um, you know, in, in Africa, there is uh, the African Leadership uh, uh, university ALU, yeah. who who is trying to do similar things. So so I I, I think there's definitely a movement in the right direction. But it's right now it's only a few outliers rather than than most of the institutions. I think for many institutions, especially those like. The one I'm at, it's very, very difficult to change, right? I mean, they've been very, very successful at doing things the old way, mm -hmm. and and changing things is just very, very scary because they may they may lose their status, and they probably will anyway. Um, but um, yeah, so so I'm I I I I agree one hundred percent with what you said, and I also was thinking, <clears throat> you know, take take my 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 model that I presented of of my class, right, with four students in their own Zoom room, online learning. What I accomplished last year, it challenges the university model. The university model is essentially bringing students to a campus. <laughs> And 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 the whole economic model is is having the students on on it's built around having the students on the campus, but last during the pandemic, I had one student in Korea, I had one in Bahrain, I had several in Israel, I had several in Latin America. They were all over the globe. We could imagine delivering a Harvard type education to many, many more students at far less cost. University is not ready, I think, to take that step, frankly. Well, I mean, there's the opportunity cost. I mean, I've slowly become, I was originally in campus teaching and then I got into distance learning and I came to the conclusion 
that campus teaching should be more or less stopped. Maybe we can keep it for the eggheads who really we're channeling towards research, but for the rest of us mortals, distance learning is probably the best value for effort. And we can achieve some of the wondrous things that people say you have to do on campus in other ways as well. I, I wouldn't, it was interesting you mentioned Minerva because Minerva is a high cost uh, option. Well, it, it's high charges. cost, right. But compared to Harvard or many other institutions yeah. in the US, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a much lower cost. But, but there is the opportunity cost of education, the fact that people need to work and, and they can't work if they're going away to a campus and things like that. So I'm coming to the conclusion is that full-time education is for the really bright, the brilliant, and the rest of us should be moving towards some sort of higher apprenticeship system where we get our higher education and work at the same time, because that's the only way to reduce costs. But uh, well, I, I I I agree almost entirely with you. I'm not 100 percent sure how you would define the brilliant ones, and 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 because I think ultimately learning is learning and learning. Whether you're brilliant or not that brilliant, you you learn the same same way. And I think integrating. I mean, I heard this fantastic talk by this person who had the higher education division at Gallup. <clears throat> he now works for Kaplan. Uh, or I can't think of his name. He he did this survey to to look at what in people's education best correlated with uh, future success and future satisfaction mm -hmm. in life, <clears throat> and he found that that almost nothing in education correlated except for two things. People checked off two check boxes. Mm -hmm. The w first one was to have some form of experiential learning, in particular, put the learning in context of the type of career path that the people wanted to follow. Mm -hmm. And the other one was to have had, you know, one or more instructors who care about you as an individual. Mm -hmm. And and in that respect, it turns out the Ivy League schools, Harvard is one of them, do extremely poorly. But then again, a place like Western Governors does extremely well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so 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 I I I I I I think that that yeah, I think for everybody the model that you're describing there should should work well. And and it could very well be that the days of um, of a brick and mortar institution are numbered. They may they may well go on for a few more hundred years, given how little has changed in a thousand years, but uh, but I, I I could well imagine that in 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 the year uh, twenty two hundred things might look very different. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Thank you for the great question and have a good evening, Adam Slager. Uh, uh, you know, as the as the futurist in this panel, I just have to say you've completely stolen my thunder, Eric. Thank you. Uh, that that was that was excellent. Uh, but also as the uh, organizer of this uh, forum, I'm afraid I have to draw to a close. We are at the end of our hour and we have raced ahead at top speed and covered a tremendous amount of ground. Uh, Eric Mazur, thank you so much for sharing so much with us. Uh, this has been an absolute delight. Um, what's, uh, what's the best way to keep up with you and, uh, and, and your work? I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm, 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 I try to make myself publicly available. I'm, I'm on most social media. You can try and email me, although I'm overloaded with, uh, with yeah. uh, email. Uh, but I'm, I'm always happy to share my work, and I typically, you know, post links to uh, to whatever I say or do. And uh, you know, I, I'd love to stay in touch with uh, every one of you. Thank you, Brian, for a fantastic conversation. Well, thank you so much for coming. And we'll have to uh, pay attention to you, especially if you have to uh, hit the streets for a new job. Um, <laughs> we, would, we would love to have you come back next year uh, so you could tell us how this extraordinary year went. I'd be delighted. And in the meantime, please take care. Good luck and stay safe. Thank you. But See you all. Go, indeed. Don't go away, friends. Uh, I've got to let you know uh, what's happening over the next few weeks. So. Uh, Thank you again, by the way, everyone, for great questions. So coming up, we have sessions on education, the post-truth world. We have a session on STEM and equity. We have one on an update on open access and scholarship, a session on rethinking learning, a forum on rethinking the university with great guests. 
Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about this, if you'd like to keep discussing uh, online learning and should that dominate, or how do we break students into small groups most effectively, please feel free to just tweet using the hashtag FTTE, or tweet at me, or tweet at Shindig Events, or use my blog, brianalexander.org. If you'd like to go back into our archives and take a look at previous sessions on various forms of active learning, including blended learning, including gaming, just head to tinyurl.com slash fdfarchive. And above all, thank you all for a fantastic conversation today. You made this all just brilliant. Uh, good luck as the fall semester begins. I hope all of you stay safe and that your educational experience is brilliant, as I know it will be from all of you. Um, and again, please take care of yourself. And until next week, we'll see you online. Bye-bye. <laughs>